Section 12 of Gleanings in Buddha Fields. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan McAdam. Gleanings in Buddha Fields by Lafcady O'Hearn. Chapter 9, Part 4. Quote, Non-existence is the only entrance to the great vehicle. Daiban Kiyoi. Quote, and in which way is it, Siha, that one speaking truly could say of me, the Samana Gotama maintains annihilation. He teaches the doctrine of annihilation. I proclaim, Siha, the annihilation of lust, of ill will, of delusion. I proclaim the annihilation of the manifold conditions of heart which are evil and not good. Mahavaga 6, 31, 7. Nin mite ho toke. See first the person, then preach the law. Is a Japanese proverb signifying that Buddhism should be taught according to the capacity of the pupil. And the great systems of Buddhist doctrine are actually divided into progressive stages, five usually, to be studied in succession, or otherwise, according to the intellectual ability of the learner. Also, there are many varieties of special doctrine held by the different sects and subsects, so that, to make any satisfactory outline of Buddhist ontology, it is necessary to shape a synthesis of the more important and non-conflicting among these many tenets. I need scarcely say that popular Buddhism does not include concepts such as we have been examining. The people hold to the simpler creed, of a veritable transmigration of souls. The people understand karma only as the law that makes the punishment or reward of faults committed in previous lives. The people do not trouble themselves about Nihon or Nirvana. Footnote. Scarcely a day passes that I do not hear such words uttered as Ingwa, Gokuraku, Gosho, or other words referring to karma, heaven, future life, past life, etc., but I have never heard a man or woman of the people use the word Nihon, and whenever I have ventured to question such about Nirvana, I found that its philosophical meaning was unknown. On the other hand, the Japanese scholar speaks of Nihon as the reality, of heaven, either as a temporary condition or as a parable. And footnote. But they think much about heaven, Gokuraku, which the members of many sects believe can be attained immediately after this life by the spirits of the good. The followers of the greatest and richest of the modern sects, the Shinju, hold that, by the invocation of Amida, a righteous person can pass at once after death to the great paradise of the West, the paradise of the lotus flower birth. I am taking no account of popular beliefs into this little study, nor of doctrines peculiar to any one sect only. But, there are many differences in the higher teaching as to the attainment of nirvana. Some authorities hold that supreme happiness can be won, or at least seen, even on this earth, while others declare that the present world is too corrupt to allow of a perfect life, and that only by winning, through good deeds, the privilege of rebirth into a better world can men hope for opportunity to practice that holiness which leads to the highest bliss? The latter opinion, which posits the superior condition of being in other worlds, better expresses the general thought of contemporary Buddhism in Japan. The conditions of human and of animal being belong to what are termed the worlds of desire, yokukai, which are four in number. Below these are the states of torment or hells, jigoku, about which many curious things are written. But neither the Yoku Kai nor the Jigoku need to be considered in relation to the purpose of this little essay. We have only to do with the course of spiritual progress from the world of men up to Nirvana, assuming, with modern Buddhism, that the pilgrimage through death and birth must continue, for the majority of mankind at least, even after the attainment of the highest conditions possible upon this globe. The way arises from terrestrial conditions to other and superior worlds, passing first through the six heavens of desire, Yoku Ten, thence through the seventeen heavens of form, Shikikai, and lastly through the four heavens of formlessness, Mushikikai, 
beyond which lies nirvana. The requirements of physical life, the need of food, rest, and sexual relations, continue to be felt in the heavens of desire, which would seem to be higher physical worlds rather than what we commonly understand by the expression heavens. Indeed, the conditions in some of them are such as might be supposed to exist in planets more favored than our own, in larger spheres, warmed by a more genial sun. And some Buddhist texts actually place them in remote constellations, declaring that the path leads from star to star, from galaxy to galaxy, from universe to universe, up to the limits of existence. Footnote. This astronomical localization of higher conditions of being, or of other Buddha fields, may provoke a smile, but it suggests undeniable possibilities. There is no absurdity in supposing that potentialities of life and growth and development really pass, with nebular diffusion and concentration, from expired systems to new systems. Indeed, not to suppose this, in our present state of knowledge, is scarcely possible for the rational mind. End footnote. In the first of the heavens of this zone, called the heaven of the four kings, Shi Ten O Ten, life lasts five times longer than life on this earth, according to number of years, and each year there is equal to fifty terrestrial years. But its inhabitants eat and drink and marry and give in marriage much after the fashion of mankind. In the succeeding heaven, Sanju San Ten, the duration of life is doubled, while all other conditions are correspondingly improved, and the grosser forms of passion disappear. The union of the sexes persists, but in a manner curiously similar to that which a certain father of the Christian church wished might become possible, a simple embrace producing a new being. In the third heaven, called Emma Ten, where longevity is again doubled, the slightest touch may create life. In the fourth, or heaven of contentment, Tochita Ten, longevity is further increased. In the fifth, or heaven of the transmutation of pleasure, Karaku Ten, strange new powers are gained. Subjective pleasures become changed at will into objective pleasures. Thoughts as well as wishes become creative forces, and even the act of seeing may cause conception and birth. In the sixth heaven, Take Jizai Ten, the powers obtained in the fifth heaven are further developed, and the subjective pleasures transmuted into objective can be presented to others, or shared with others, like material gifts. But the look of an instance, one glance of an eye, may generate a new karma. The Yoku Kai are all heavens of sensuous life, Heaven such as might answer to the dreams of artists and lovers and poets. But those who are able to traverse them without falling, and a fall, be it observed, is not difficult, pass into the supersensual zone, first entering the heavens of luminous observation of existence and of calm meditation upon existence, Ujin Ushi Shoryo, or Kakwan. These are in number three each higher than the preceding, and are named the heaven of sanctity, the heaven of higher sanctity, and the heaven of great sanctity. After these come the heavens called the heavens of luminous observation of non-existence and of calm meditation upon non-existence, Mujin Mushi Shoryo. These also are three, and the names of them in their order signify lesser light, light unfathomable, and light making sound, or light sonorous. Here there is attained the highest degree of supersensuous joy possible to temporary conditions. Above are states named Riki Shoryo, or the heavens of meditation of the abandonment of joy. The names of these states in their ascending order are Lesser Purity, Purity Unfathomable, and Purity Supreme. In them, neither joy nor pain, nor forceful feeling of any sort exists. There is a mild negative pleasure only, the pleasure of heavenly equanimity. Footnote. One is reminded by this conception of Mr. Spencer's beautiful definition of equanimity. Equanimity may be compared to white light, which, though composed of numerous colors, is colorless. While pleasurable and painful moods of mind may be compared to the modifications of light that result from increasing the proportions of some rays, 
and decreasing the proportions of others. Principles of Psychology and Footnote Higher than these heavens are the eight spheres of calm meditation upon the abandonment of all joy and pleasure, Riki Raku Shoryo. These are called the cloudless, holiness manifest, vast results, empty of name, void of heat, fair appearing, vision perfecting, and the limit of form. Herein pleasure and pain, and name and form, pass utterly away. But there remain ideas and thoughts. He who can pass through these supersensual realms enters at once into the Mushiki Kai, the spheres of formlessness. These are four. In the first state of the Mushiki Kai, all sense of individuality is lost. Even the thought of name and form becomes extinct, and there survives only the idea of infinite space or emptiness. In the second state of Mushiki Kai, this idea of space vanishes, and its place is filled by the idea of infinite reason. But this idea of reason is anthropomorphic. It is an illusion, and it fades out in the third state of the Mushiki Kai, which is called the state of nothing to take hold of, or Musho Usho Jo. Here is only the idea of infinite nothingness. But even this condition has been reached by the aid of action of the personal mind. This action ceases. Then, the fourth state of the Mushiki Kai is reached, the Hiso Hi Hiso Sho, or state of neither namelessness nor not namelessness. Something of personal mentality continues to float vaguely here, the very uttermost expiring vibration of karma, the last vanishing haze of being. It melts, and the immeasurable revelation comes. The dreaming Buddha, freed from the last ghostly bond of self, rises at once into the infinite bliss of nirvana. But every being does not pass through all the states above enumerated. The power to rise swiftly or slowly depends upon the acquisition of merit as well as upon the character of the karma to be overcome. Some beings pass to nirvana immediately after the present life, some after a single new birth, some after two or three births, while many rise directly from this world into one of the super-sensuous heavens. All such are called the Cho, the Leapers, of whom the highest class reach nirvana at once after their death as men or women. There are two great divisions of Cho, the Fuquan, or never-returning ones. Footnote. In the Sutra of the Great Decease, we find the instance of a woman reaching this condition. Quote, the sister Nanda, O Ananda, by the destruction of the five bonds that bind people to this world, has become an inhabitant of the highest heaven, there to pass entirely away, thence never to return. End footnote. And the Quan, returning ones, or revenants. Sometimes the return may be in the nature of a prolonged retrogression, and, according to a Buddhist legend of the origin of the world, the first men were beings who had fallen from the Koan Ten, or heaven of sonorous light. A remarkable fact about the whole theory of progression is that the progression is not conceived of, except in very rare cases, as an advance in straight lines, but as an advance by undulations, a cyclical rhythm of motion. This is exemplified by the curious Buddhist classification of the different short courses by which the Kwan or revenants may hope to reach nirvana. These short courses are divided into even and uneven, the former includes an equal number of heavenly and of earthly rebirths, while in the latter class the heavenly and earthly intermediate rebirths are not equal in number. There are four kinds of these intermediate stages. A Japanese friend has drawn for me the accompanying diagrams, which explain the subject clearly. Fantastic this may be called, but it harmonizes with the truth that all progress is necessarily rhythmical. Though all beings do not pass through every stage of the great journey, all beings who attain the highest enlightenment, by any course whatever, acquire certain faculties not belonging to particular conditions of birth, but only to particular conditions of psychical development. Note, the next two pages, pages 251 and 252, contain a number of diagrams of the paths through the heavens. And note, 
These are the Roku Jinsu, Abajana, or Six Supernatural Powers. Footnote. Different Buddhist systems give different enumerations of these mysterious powers, whereof the Chinese names literally signify 1. Calm meditation outward pouring no obstacle wisdom. 2. Heaven eye no obstacle wisdom. 3. Heaven ear no obstacle wisdom. 4. Other minds no obstacle wisdom. 5. Former states no obstacle wisdom. 6. Leak extinction no obstacle wisdom. End footnote. 1. Shinkyotsu, the power of passing any whither through any obstacle, through solid walls, for example. 2. Tengensu, the power of infinite vision. 3. Tenitsu, the power of infinite hearing. 4. Tashinsu, the power of knowing the thoughts of all other beings. 5. Shukujutsu, the power of remembering former births. 6. Rojinsu, infinite wisdom with the power of entering at will into nirvana. The Roku Jinsu first begin to develop in the state of Shoman, Shravaka, and expand in the higher conditions of Engaku, Pratyaka Buddha, and of Bosatsu, Bodhisattva, or Mahatsattva. The power of the Shoman may be exerted over 2,000 worlds, those of the Engaku or Bosatsu over 3,000, but the powers of the Buddhahood extend over the total cosmos. The first state of holiness, for example, comes the memory of a certain number of former births, together with the capacity to foresee a corresponding number of future births. In the next higher state, the number of births remembered increases, and in the state of Bosatsu, all former births are visible to memory. But the Buddha sees not only all of his own former births, but likewise all births that ever have been or can be, and all the thoughts and acts, past, present, or future, of all past, present, or future beings. Now these dreams of supernatural power merit attention because of the ethical teaching in regard to them, the same which is woven through every Buddhist hypothesis, rational or unthinkable, the teaching of self-abnegation. The supernatural powers must never be used for personal pleasure, but only for the highest beneficence. The propagation of doctrine, the saving of men. Any exercise of them for lesser ends might result in their loss, would certainly signify retrogression in the path. Footnote. Beings who have reached the state of Engaku or of Bosatsu are not supposed capable of retrogression or of any serious error, but it is otherwise in lower spiritual states. End footnote. To show them for the purpose of exciting admiration or wonder were to juggle wickedly with what is divine, and the teacher himself is recorded to have once severely rebuked a needless display of them by a disciple. This giving up not only of one life, but of countless lives, not only of one world, but of innumerable worlds, not only of natural, but also of supernatural pleasures, not only of selfhood, but of godhood, is certainly not for the miserable privilege of ceasing to be, but for a privilege infinitely outweighing all that even paradise can give. Nirvana is no cessation, but an emancipation. It means only the passing of conditioned into unconditioned being, the fading of all mental and physical phantoms into the light of formless omnipotence and omniscience. But the Buddhist hypothesis holds some suggestion of the persistence of that which has once been able to remember all births and states of limited being. The persistence of the identity of the Buddhas even in Nirvana, notwithstanding the teaching that all Buddhas are one. How reconcile this doctrine of monism with the assurance of various texts that the being who enters Nirvana can, when so desirous, reassume an earthly personality? There are some very remarkable texts on this subject in the Sutra of the Lotus of the Good Law. Those, for instance, in which the Tathagata Prabhutaratna is pictured as sitting perfectly extinct upon his throne, and speaking before a vast assembly to which he has been introduced as the great seer, who, although perfectly extinct for many cotes of aeons, now comes to hear the law. These texts themselves offer us a riddle of multiplicity and unity, for the Tathagata Prabhutaratna and the myriads of other extinct Buddhas who appear simultaneously are said to have been all incarnations of but a single Buddha. 
a reconciliation is offered by the hypothesis of what might be called a pluralistic monism a sole reality composed of groups of consciousness at once independent and yet interdependent or to speak of pure mind in terms of matter an atomic spiritual ultimate this hypothesis though not doctrinably enunciated in buddhist texts is distinctly implied both by text and commentary the absolute of buddhism is one as ether is one ether is conceivable only as a composition of units footnote this position it will be observed is very dissimilar from that of hartmann who holds that all plurality of individuation belongs to the sphere of phenomenality volume two page two thirty three of english translation one is rather reminded of the thought of galton that human beings may contribute more or less unconsciously to the manifestation of a far higher life than our own somewhat as the individual cells of one of the more complex animals contribute to the manifestation of its higher order personality hereditary genius page 361 another thought of galton's expressed on the same page of work just quoted from is still more strongly suggestive of the buddhist concept we must not permit ourselves to consider each human or other personality as something supernaturally added to the stock of nature but rather as a segregation of what already existed under a new shape and as a regular consequence of previous conditions neither must we be misled by the word individuality we may look upon each individual as something not wholly detached from its parent source as a wave that has been lifted in shape by normal conditions in an unknown and illimitable ocean the reader should remember that the buddhist hypothesis does not imply either individuality or personality in nirvana but simply entity not a spiritual body in our meaning of the term but only a divine consciousness heart in the sense of divine mind is a term used in some japanese texts to describe such entity in the dainichi kyoso commentary on the dainichi sutra for example is the statement when all seeds of karma life are entirely burnt out and annihilated then the vacuum pure bodhi heart is reached i may observe that the buddhist metaphysicians use the term vacuum bodies to describe one of the high conditions of entity the following from the fifty-first volume of the work called daizo ho su will also be found interesting by experience the tathagata possesses all forms forms for multitude numberless as the dust grains of the universe the tathagata gets himself born in such places as he desires or in accord with the desire of others and there saves literally carries over that is over the sea of birth and death all sentient beings wheresoever his will finds an abiding point there is he embodied this is called will birth body the buddha makes law his body and remains pure as empty space this is called law body and footnote the absolute is conceivable only according to any attempt at synthesis of japanese doctrines as composed of buddhas but here the student finds himself voyaging farther perhaps beyond the bar of the thinkable than western philosophers have ever ventured all are one each by union becomes equal with all we are not only bidden to imagine the ultimate reality as composed of units of conscious being but to believe each unit permanently equal to every other and infinite in potentiality footnote half of this buddhist thought is really embodied in tennyson's line quote, boundless inward in the atom boundless outward in the whole and footnote the central reality of every living creature is a pure buddha the visible form and thinking self which encell it being but karma with some degree of truth it might be said that buddhism substitutes for our theory of a universe of physical atoms the hypothesis of a universe of psychical units not that it necessarily denies our theory of physical atoms but that it assumes a position which might be thus expressed in words what you call atoms are really combinations unstable aggregates essentially impermanent and therefore essentially unreal atoms are but karma and this position is suggestive 
we know nothing whatever of the ultimate nature of substance and motion but we have scientific evidence that the known has been evolved from the unknown that the atoms of our elements are combinations and that what we call matter and force are but different manifestations of a single and infinite unknown reality there are wonderful buddhist pictures which at first sight appear to have been made like other japanese pictures with bold free sweeps of a skilled brush but which when closely examined proved to have been executed in a much more marvelous manner the figures the features the robes the aureoles also the scenery the colors the effects of mist or cloud all even to the tiniest detail of tone or line have been produced by groupings of microscopic chinese characters tinted according to position and more or less thickly enmassed according to need of light or shade in brief these pictures are composed entirely out of texts of sutras they are mosaics of minute ideographs each ideograph a combination of strokes and the symbol at once of a sound and of an idea is our universe so composed an endless phantasmagory made only by combinations of combinations of combinations of combinations of units finding quality and form through unimaginable affinities now thickly massed in solid glooms now palpating in tremulosities of light and color always and everywhere grouped by some stupendous art into one vast mosaic of polarities yet each unit in itself a complexity inconceivable and each in itself also a symbol only a character a single ideograph of the undecipherable text of the infinite riddle ask the chemists and the mathematicians gleanings in buddha fields by lafcady o'hearn chapter nine part five quote all beings that have life shall lay aside their complex form that aggregation of mental and material qualities that gives them or in heaven or in earth their fleeting individuality the book of the great decease in every teleological system there are conceptions which cannot bear the test of modern psychological analysis and in the foregoing unfilled outline of a great religious hypothesis there will doubtless be recognized some ghosts of beliefs haunting those mazes of verbal propositions in which metaphysicians habitually lose themselves but truths will be perceived also grand recognitions of the law of ethical evolution of the price of progress and of our relation to the changeless reality abiding beyond all change the buddhist estimate of the enormity of that opposition to moral progress which humanity must overcome is fully sustained by our scientific knowledge of the past and perception of the future mental and moral advance has thus far been effected only through constant struggle against inheritances older than reason or moral feeling against the instincts and appetites of primitive brute life and the buddhist teaching that the average man can hope to leave his worst nature behind him only after the lapse of millions of future lives is much more of a truth than a theory only through millions of births have we been able to reach even this our present imperfect state and the dark bequests of our darkest past are still strong enough betimes to prevail over reason and ethical feeling every future forward pace upon the moral path will have to be taken against the massed effort of millions of ghostly wills for those past selves which priests and poet have told us to use as steps to higher things are not dead nor even likely to die for a thousand generations to come they are too much alive they have still power to clutch the climbing feet sometimes even to fling back the climber into the primeval slime again in its legends of the heavens of desire progress through which depends upon the ability of triumphant virtues to refuse what it has won buddhism gives us a wonder story full of evolutional truth the difficulties of moral self-elevation do not disappear with the amelioration of material social conditions in our own day they rather increase as life becomes more complex more multiform so likewise do the obstacles of ethical advance so likewise do the results of thoughts and acts the expansion of intellectual power the refinement of sensibility the enlargement of the sympathies the intensive quickening of the sense of beauty all multiply ethical dangers just as certainly as they multiply ethical opportunities 
the highest material results of civilization, and the increase of possibilities of pleasure, exact an exercise of self-mastery and a power of ethical balance, needless and impossible in older and lower states of existence. The Buddhist doctrine of impermanency is the doctrine also of modern science. Either might be uttered in the words of the other. Natural knowledge, wrote Huxley in one of his latest and finest essays, tends more and more to the conclusion that all the choir of heaven and the furniture of earth are the transitory forms of parcels of cosmic substance wending along the road of evolution from nebulous potentiality through endless growths of sun and planet and satellite through all varieties of matter through infinite diversity of life and thought possibly through modes of being of which we neither have a conception nor are competent to form any back to the indefinable latency from which they rose thus the most obvious attribute of the cosmos is its impermanency and finally it may be said that buddhism not only presents remarkable accordance with nineteenth-century thought in regard to the instability of all integrations the ethical signification of heredity the lesson of mental evolution the duty of moral progress but it also agrees with science in repudiating equally our doctrines of materialism and of spiritualism our theory of a creator and of special creation and our belief in the immortality of the soul yet in spite of this repudiation of the very foundations of occidental religion it has been able to give us the revelation of larger religious possibilities the suggestions of a universal scientific creed nobler than any which has ever existed precisely in that period of our own intellectual evolution when faith in a personal god is passing away when the belief in an individual soul is becoming impossible when the most religious minds shrink away from everything that we have been calling religion when the universal doubt is an ever-growing weight upon ethical aspiration light is offered from the east there we find ourselves in presence of an older and vaster faith holding no gross anthropomorphic conceptions of immeasurable reality and denying the existence of soul but nevertheless inculcating a system of morals superior to any other and maintaining a hope which no possible future form of positive knowledge can destroy reinforced by the teaching of science the teaching of this more ancient faith is that for thousands of years we have been thinking inside out and upside down the only reality is one all that we have taken for substance is only shadow and the physical is the unreal and the outer man is the ghost end of section 12 recording by dan mcadam section 13 of gleanings in buddha fields this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org chapter 10 the rebirth of katsugoro the following is not a story at least it is not one of my stories it is only the translation of an old japanese document or rather series of documents very much signed and sealed and dating back to the early part of the present century my friend amenamori who is always seeking rare japanese and chinese manuscripts and seems to have some preternatural power for discovering them found this one in the library of count sasaki in tokyo thinking it to be a curious thing he obtained kindly permission to have a copy of it made for me and from that copy the translation was done i am responsible for nothing beyond a few notes appended to the text although the beginning will probably prove dry reading i presume it to advise the perusal of the whole translation from first to last because it suggests many things beside the possibility of remembering former births it will be found to reflect something of the feudal japan passed away and something of the old-time faith not the higher buddhism but what is incomparably more difficult for any occidental to obtain a glimpse of the common ideas of the people concerning pre-existence and rebirth and in view of this fact the exactness of the official investigations and the credibility of the evidence accepted necessarily becomes questions of minor importance copy of the report of Temon dempachiro 
the case of katsugoro nine years old second son of genzo a farmer in my estate dwelling in the village called nakanomura in the district called tamagori in the province of musashi some time during the autumn of last year the above-mentioned katsugoro the son of genzo told his elder sister the story of his previous existence and of his rebirth but as it seemed to be only the fancy of a child she gave little heed to it afterwards however when katsugoro had told her the same story over and over again she began to think that it was a strange thing and she told her parents about it during the twelfth month of the past year genzo himself questioned katsugoro about the matter whereupon katsugoro declared that he had been in his former existence the son of a certain kyobe a farmer of hodokobomura which is a village within the jurisdiction of the lord komiya in the district called tamagori in the province of musashi that he katsugoro the son of kyobe had died of smallpox at the age of six years and that he had been reborn thereafter into the family of genzo before mentioned though this seemed unbelievable the boy repeated all the circumstances of his story with so much exactness and apparent certainty that the headmen and the elders of the village made a formal investigation of the case as the news of this event soon spread it was heard by the family of a certain hanshiro living in the village called hodoku bomura and hanshiro then came to the house of the genzo aforesaid a farmer belonging to my estate and found that everything was true which the boy had said about the personal appearance and the facial characteristics of his former parents and about the aspect of the house which had been his home in his previous birth katsugoro was then taken to the house of hanshiro in hodokubomura and the people there said he looked very much like their tozo who had died a number of years before at the age of six since then the two families have been visiting each other at intervals the people of other neighboring villages seem to have heard of the matter and now persons come daily from various places to see katsugoro a deposition regarding the above facts have been made before me by persons dwelling on my estate i summoned the man genzo to my house and there examined him his answers to my questions did not contradict the statements before mentioned by other parties occasionally in the world some rumour of such a matter as this spreads among the people indeed it is hard to believe such things but i beg to make report of the present case hoping the same will reach your august ear so that i may not be charged with negligence signed temon dempachiro the fourth month and the sixth year of bonsai eighteen twenty three copy of the letter written by kuzanawo to taiken priest of Sengakuji. I have been favored with the accompanying copy of the report of Temon Denpachiro by Shika Hyoiman-sama, who brought it to me, and I take great pleasure in sending it to you. I think it might be well for you to preserve it, together with the writing from Kwanzan-sama, which you kindly showed me the other day. Signed, Kuzanowo. Twenty-first day of the sixth month copy of the letter matsudaira kwanzan daimyo to the priest taikin of the temple called sengakuji i herewith enclose and send you the account of the rebirth of katsugoro i have written it in the popular style thinking that it might have a good effect in helping to silence those who do not believe in the doctrines of the buddha as a literary work it is of course a wretched thing i send it to you supposing that it could only amuse you from that point of view but as for the relation itself it is without mistake for i myself heard it from the grandmother of katsugoro when you have read it please return it to me signed kwanzan twentieth day relation of the rebirth of katsugoro introductory note by the priest taiken this is the account of a true fact for it has been written by matsudaira kwanzan-sama who himself went to nakanomura on the twenty-second day of the third month of this year for the special purpose of inquiring about the matter after having obtained a glimpse of katsugoro 
he questioned the boy's grandmother as to every particular and he wrote down her answers exactly as they were given afterwards the said kwanzan sama condescended to honour this temple with a visit on the fourteenth day of this fourth month and with his own august lips told me about his visit to the family of the aforesaid katsugoro furthermore he vouchsafed me the favour of permitting me to read the before-mentioned writing on the twentieth day of this same month and availing myself to the privilege i immediately made a copy of the writing signed taiken so facsimile of the priest's kakihan or private sign manual made with the brush sengakuji the twenty-first day of the fourth month of the sixth year of bunsai eighteen twenty three names of the members of the two families concerned family of genzo katsugoro born the tenth day of the tenth month of the twelfth year of bunkwa eighteen fifteen nine years old this sixth year of bunsai eighteen twenty three footnote the western reader is requested to bear in mind that the year in which a japanese child is born is counted always as one year in the reckoning of age End of footnote second son of genso a farmer living in tenatsuriri in nakanomura district of tamagori province of musashi estate of taimon Dempachiro, whose yashiki is in the street called shichikenjo netsu yido jurisdiction of yusuki genzo father of katsugoro family name koyada forty-nine years old this sixth year of bunsai being poor he occupies himself with the making of baskets which he sells in yedo the name of the inn at which he lodges while in yedo is sagamaya kept by one kihai in bakurocho sai wife of genso and mother of katsugoro thirty-nine years old this sixth year of bunsai daughter of murata kichitaro samurai once an archer in the service of the lord of uwari when sai was twelve years old she was a maid servant it is said in the house of honda daino shindono when she was thirteen years old her father kichitaro was dismissed for ever for a certain cause from the service of the lord of uwari and he became a ronin footnote literal translation a wave man a wandering samurai without a lord the ronin were generally a desperate and very dangerous class but there were some fine characters among them and a footnote he died at the age of seventy-five on the twenty-fifth day of the fourth month of the fourth year of bunkwa eighteen o seven his grave is in the cemetery of the temple called irinji of the zen sect in the village of shimo yusuki tsuya grandmother of katsugoro seventy-two years old this sixth year of bunsai when young she served as maid in the household of matsudaira oki no kami dono daimyo fusa elder sister of katsugoro fifteen years old this year otojiro elder brother of katsugoro fourteen years old this year tsune younger sister of katsugoro four years old this year family of hanshiro tozo died at the age of six in hodokubo mura in the district called tamagori in the province of musashi a state of nekane uyiman whose yashiki is in the street of atarashi bashidori shitea yedo jurisdiction of komiya tozo was born in the second year of bunkwa eighteen o five and died about the fourth hour of the day ten o'clock in the morning on the fourth day of the second month of the seventh year of bunkwa eighteen ten the sickness of which he died was smallpox buried in the graveyard on the hill above the village before mentioned hodokubo mura parochial temple iwoji in misawa mura sect zenshu last year of the fifth year of bunkwa eighteen twenty two the jiusan kwaiki was said for toso footnote the buddhist services for the dead are celebrated at regular intervals increasing successively in length until the time of one hundred years after death 
the jiusan koiki is the service for the thirteenth year after death by thirteenth in the context the reader must understand that the year in which the death took place is counted for one year and a footnote hanshiro stepfather of tozo family name suzaki fifty years old this sixth year of bunsai shizu mother of tozo forty-nine years old this sixth year of bunsai kyube afterwards togoro real father of tozo original name kyubai afterwards changed to togoro died at the age of forty-eight in the sixth year of bunkwa eighteen o nine when tozo was five years old to replace him hanshiro became an irimuko footnote the second husband by adoption of a daughter who lives with her own parents and a footnote children two boys and two girls these are hanshiro's children by the mother of tozo copy of the account written in popular style by the matsudaira kwanzan dono daimo some time in the eleventh month of the past year when katsugoro was playing in the rice field with his elder sister fusa he asked her elder sister where did you come from before you were born into our household fusa answered him how can i know what happened to me before i was born katsugoro looked surprised and exclaimed then you cannot remember anything that happened before you were born do you remember asked fusa indeed i do replied katsugoro i used to be the son of kyubei san in hodokubo and my name was then tozo do you not know all that ah said fusa i shall tell father and mother about it but katsugoro at once began to cry and said please do not tell it would not be good to tell father and mother fusa made answer after a little while well this time i shall not tell but the next time that you do anything naughty then i will tell after that day whenever a dispute arose between the two the sister would threaten the brother saying very well then i shall tell that thing to father and mother at these words the boy would always yield to his sister this happened many times and the parents one day overheard fusa making her threat thinking katsugoro must have been doing something wrong they desired to know what the matter was and fusa being questioned told them the truth then genzo and his wife and suya the grandmother of katsugoro thought it a very strange thing they called katsugoro therefore and tried first by coaxing and then by threatening to make him tell what he had meant by those words after hesitation katsugoro said i will tell you everything i used to be the son of kyubei san of hodokubo and the name of my mother then was oshidzu san when i was five years old kyubei san died and there came in his place a man called hanshiro san who loved me very much but in the following year when i was six years old i died of smallpox in the third year after that i entered mother's honourable womb and was born again the parents and the grandmother of the boy wondered greatly at hearing this and they decided to make all possible inquiry as to the man called hanshiro of hodokubo but as they had to work very hard every day to earn a living and so could spare but little time for any other matter they could not at once carry out their intention now sai the mother of katsugoro had nightly to suckle her little daughter tsune who was four years old footnote children in japan among the poorer classes are not weaned until an age much later than what is considered the proper age for weaning children in western countries but four years old in this text may mean considerably less than three by western reckoning and a footnote and katsugoro therefore slept with his grandmother tsuya sometimes he used to talk to her in bed and one night when he was in a very confiding mood she persuaded him to tell her what happened at the time when he had died when he said until i was four years old i used to remember everything but since then i have become more and more forgetful and now i forget many many things but i still remember that i died of smallpox i remember that i was put into a jar footnote from very ancient time in japan it has been the custom to bury the dead in large jars usually of red earthenware called kame such jars are still used although a large proportion of the dead are buried in wooden coffins of a form unknown in the occident End of footnote 
I remember I was buried on a hill. There was a hole made in the ground, and the people let the jar drop into that hole. It fell, pum, and I remember that sound well. Then somehow I returned to the house, and I stopped on my own pillow there. Footnote. The idea expressed is not of lying down with the pillow under the head, but of hovering about the pillow, or resting upon it as an insect might do. The bodiless spirit is usually said to rest upon the roof of the home. The apparition of the aged man referred to in the next sentence seems a thought of Shinto rather than of Buddhism. End of footnote. In a short time, some old man, looking like a grandfather, came and took me away. I do not know who or what he was. As I walked, I went through empty air as if flying. I remember it was neither night nor day as we went. It was always like sunset time. I did not feel either warm or cold or hungry. We went very far, I think. But still, I could hear always, faintly, the voices of people talking at home and the sound of Nambuzo being said for me. Footnote. The repetition of the Buddhist invocation, Namu Amida Butsu, is thus named. The Nambutsu is repeated by many Buddhist sects, besides the sect of Amida proper, the Shinshu. And a footnote. I remember also that when the people at home set offerings of hot botamochi before the household shrine, Butsudan, Footnote. Botamochi, a kind of sugared rice cake. And a footnote. I inhaled the vapor of the offerings. Grandmother, never forget to offer warm food to the honorable dead, Hotoke-sama, and do not forget to give to priests. I am sure it is very good to do these things. Footnote. Such advice is commonplace in Japanese Buddhist literature. By Hotoke-sama, here the boy means not the Buddha's proper, but the spirits of the dead, hopefully termed Buddhas by those who loved them, much as in the West we sometimes speak of our dead as angels. End of footnote. After that, I only remember that the old man led me by some roundabout way to this place. I remember we passed the road beyond the village. Then we came here, and he pointed to this house and said to me, Now you must be reborn, for it is three years since you died. You are to be reborn in that house. The person who will become your grandmother is very kind, so it will be well for you to be conceived and born there. After saying this, the old man went away. I remained a little time under the khaki tree before the entrance of this house. Then I was going to enter when I heard talking inside. Someone said that because father was now earning so little, mother would have to go to service in Yedo. I thought... I will not go into that house, and I stopped three days in the garden. On the third day it was decided that, after all, mother would not have to go to Yedo. The same night I passed into the house through a knot-hole in the sliding shutters, and after that I stayed for three days beside the Kamado. Footnote. The cooking place in a Japanese kitchen. Sometimes the word is translated kitchen range, but the Kamado is something very different from a western kitchen range. End of footnote. Then I entered mother's honorable womb. Footnote. Here I think it better to omit a couple of sentences in the original rather too plain for Western taste, yet not without interest. The meaning of the omitted passages is only that, even in the womb, the child acted with consideration and according to the rules of filial piety. End of footnote. I remember that I was born without any pain at all. Grandmother, you may tell this to father and mother, but please never tell it to anybody else. The grandmother told Genzo and his wife what Katsugoro had related to her, and after that the boy was not afraid to speak freely with his parents on the subject of his former existence, and would often say to them, I want to go to Hondo Kubo. Please let me make a visit to the tomb of Kyobe-san. Genzo thought that Katsugoro being a strange child, would probably die before long, and that it might therefore be better to make an inquiry at once as to whether there really was a man in Hodokubo called Hanshiro. But he did not wish to make the inquiry himself, because for a man to do so, under such circumstances, would seem inconsiderate or forward. Therefore, instead of going himself to Hodokubo, 
he asked his mother tsuya on the twentieth day of the first month of this year to take her grandson there tsuya went with katsugoro to horokubo and when they entered the village she pointed to the near dwellings and asked the boy which house is it is it this house or that one no answered katsugoro it is further on much further and he hurried before her reaching a certain dwelling at last he cried this is the house and ran in without waiting for his grandmother suya followed him in and asked the people there what was the name of the owner of the house hanshiro one of them answered she asked the name of hanshiro's wife shidzu was the reply then she asked whether there had ever been a son called tozo born at that house yes was the answer but that boy died thirteen years ago when he was six years old then for the first time tsuya was convinced that katsugoro had spoken the truth and she could not help shedding tears she related to the people of the house all that katsugoro had told her about his remembrance of his former birth then hanshiro and his wife wondered greatly they caressed katsugoro and wept and they remarked that he was much handsomer now than he had been as tozo before dying at the age of six in the meantime katsugoro was looking all about and seeing the roof of a tobacco shop opposite to the house of hanshiro he pointed to it and said that used not to be there and he also said that tree yonder used not to be there all this was true so from the minds of hanshiro and his wife every doubt departed gawo yirishi on the same day tsuya and katsugoro returned to tanitsuiri nakanomura afterwards genzo sent his son several times to hanshiro's house and allowed him to visit the tomb of kyubei his real father in his previous existence sometimes katsugoro says i am a nonosama footnote nonosan or sama is the child word for the spirits of the dead for the buddhas and for the shinto gods kami nonosan wougamu to pray to the nonosan is the child phrase for praying to the gods the spirit of the ancestors become nonosan kami according to shinto thought and a footnote therefore please be kind to me sometimes he also says to his grandmother i think i shall die when i am sixteen but as ontake sama has taught us dying is not a matter to be afraid of footnote the reference here to antake sama has a particular interest that will need some considerable explanation ontake or mitake is the name of a celebrated holy peak in the province of shinano a great resort for pilgrims during the tokugawa shogunate a priest called Eshin of the rishu buddhists made a pilgrimage to that mountain returning to his native place sakamoto cho shitaya yedo he began to preach certain new doctrines and to make for himself a reputation as a miracle worker by virtue of powers said to have been gained during his pilgrimage to antake the shogunate considered him a dangerous person and banished him to the island of hachijo where he remained for some years afterwards he was allowed to return to yedo and there to preach his new faith which he gave the name azuma kyo it was buddhist teaching in a shinto disguise the deities especially adored by its followers being okuni nushi and sukuna hikona as buddhist avatars in the prayer of the sect called kaibyako norito it is said the divine nature is immovable fudo yet it moves it is formless yet manifests itself in forms this is the incomprehensible divine body in heaven and earth it is called kami in all things it is called spirit in man it is called mind from this only reality came the heavens the four oceans the great whole of the three thousand universes from the one mind emanate three thousands of great thousands of forms in the eleventh year of bunkwa eighteen fourteen a man called shimoyama suki originally an oil merchant in hiimoncho asakusa yedo organized on the basis of ishin's teaching a religious association named komeiko it flourished until the overthrow of the shogunate 
when a law was issued forbidding the teaching of mixed doctrines and the blending of shinto with buddhist religion shimoyama osuke then applied for permission to establish a new shinto sect under the name of metakekyo popularly called ontakekyo the permission was given the sixth year of meiji eighteen seventy three osuke then remodeled the buddhist sutra fudokyo under the title shinto fudo norito the sect still flourishes and one of its chief temples is situated about a mile from my present residence in tokyo ontakesan or sama is a popular name given to the deities adored by this sect it really means the deity dwelling on the peak mitake or ontake but the name is also sometimes applied to the high priest of the sect who is supposed to be oracularly inspired by the deity of ontake and to make revelations of the truth through the power of the divinity in the mouth of the boy katsugoro ontake sama means the high priest of that time eighteen twenty three almost certainly osuke himself then chief of tomoyekyo end of footnote when his parents ask him would you not like to become a priest he answers i would rather not be a priest the village people do not call him katsugoro any more they have nicknamed him hodoku bokozo the acolyte of hodokubo footnote kozo is the name given to a buddhist acolyte or a youth studying for the priesthood but it is also given to errand boys and little boy servants sometimes perhaps because in former days the heads of little boys were shaved i think that the meaning in this text is acolyte End of footnote. when any one visits the house to see him he becomes shy at once and runs to hide himself in the inner apartments so it is not possible to have any direct conversation with him i have written down this account exactly as his grandmother gave it to me i asked whether genzo his wife or tsuya could any of them remember having done any virtuous deeds genzo and his wife said that they had never done anything especially virtuous but that tsuya the grandmother had always been in the habit of repeating the nembutsu every morning and evening and that she never failed to give two mon to any priest or pilgrim who came to the door footnote in that time the name of the smallest coin equaled one-tenth of one cent it was about the same as that now called rin a copper with a square hole in the middle and bearing chinese characters End of footnote. but excepting these small matters she never had done anything which could be called a particularly virtuous act this is the end of the relation of the rebirth of katsugoro note by the translator the foregoing is taken from a manuscript entitled shinsetsu shuki or a manuscript collection of uncommon stories made between the fourth month of the sixth year of bunsai and the tenth month of the sixth year of tempo eighteen twenty three to eighteen thirty five at the end of the manuscript is written from the years of bunsai to the years of tempo mina misempa owner kurumacho shiba yedo under this again is the following note bought from yamatoya sukujiro nishino kubo twenty-first day second year of meiji eighteen sixty nine from which it would appear that the manuscript had been written by minami senpa who collected stories to him or copied them from manuscripts obtained by him during the thirteen years of eighteen twenty three to eighteen thirty five inclusive perhaps somebody will now be unreasonable enough to ask whether i believe this story as if my belief or disbelief had anything to do with the matter the question of the possibility of remembering former births seems to me to depend upon the question what it is that remembers if it is the infinite all self in each one of us then i can believe the whole of the jatakas without any trouble as to the false self the mere woof and warp of sensation and desire then i can best express my idea by relating a dream which i once dreamed whether it was a dream of the night or a dream of the day need not concern any one since it was only a dream end of section thirteen recording by corinne lepage
Section 14 of Gleanings in Buddha Fields. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. Gleanings in Buddha Fields by Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter 11 Within the Circle. Neither personal pain nor personal pleasure can be really expressed in words it is never possible to communicate them in their original form it is only possible by vivid portrayal of the circumstances or conditions causing them to awaken in sympathetic minds some kindred qualities of feeling but if the circumstances causing the pain or the pleasure be totally foreign to common human experience then no representation of them can make fully known the sensations which they evoked hopeless therefore any attempt to tell the real pain of seeing my former births i can say only that no combination of suffering possible to individual being could be likened to such pain the pain of countless lives interwoven it seemed as if every nerve of me had been prolonged into some monstrous web of sentiency spun back through a million years and as if the whole of that measureless woof and warp over all its shivering threads were pouring into my consciousness out of the abysmal past some ghastliness without name some horror too vast for human brain to hold for as i looked backward i became double quadruple octuple i multiplied by arithmetical progression i became hundreds and thousands and feared with the terror of thousands and despaired with the anguish of thousands and shuddered with the agony of thousands yet knew the pleasures of none all joys all delights appeared but mists or mockeries only the pain and the fear were real and always always growing then in the moment when sentiency itself seemed bursting into dissolution one divine touch ended the frightful vision and brought again to me the simple consciousness of the single present oh how unspeakably delicious that sudden shrinking back out of multiplicity into unity that immense immeasurable collapse of self into the blind oblivious numbness of individuality to others also said the voice of the divine one who had thus saved me to others in the like state it has been permitted to see something of their pre-existence but no one of them ever could endure to look far power to see all former births belongs only to those eternally released from the bonds of self such exist outside of illusion outside of form and name and pain cannot come nigh them but to you remaining in illusion not even the buddha could give power to look back more than a little way still you are bewitched by the follies of art and of poetry and of music the delusions of color and form the delusions of sensuous speech the delusions of sensuous sound still that apparition called nature which is but another name for emptiness and shadow deceives and charms you and fills you with dreams of longing for the things of sense but he who truly wishes to know must not love this phantom nature must not find delight in the radiance of a clear sky nor in the sight of the sea nor in the sound of the flowing of rivers nor in the forms of peaks and woods and valleys nor in the colors of them he who truly wishes to know must not find delight in contemplating the works and the deeds of men nor in hearing their converse nor in observing the puppet play of their passions and of their emotions all this is but a weaving of smoke a shimmering of vapors an impermanency a phantasmagory for the pleasures that men term lofty or noble or sublime are but larger sensualisms subtler falsities venomous fair-seeming flowerings of selfishness 
all rooted in the elder slime of appetites and desires to joy in the radiance of a cloudless day to see the mountains shift their tintings to the wheeling of the sun to watch the passing of waves the fading of sunsets to find charm in the blossoming of plants or trees all this is of the senses not less truly of the senses is the pleasure of observing actions called great or beautiful or heroic since it is one with the pleasure of imagining these things for which men miserably strive in this miserable world brief love and fame and honour all of which are empty as passing foam sky sun and sea the peaks the woods the plains all splendors and forms and colors are spectres the feelings and the thoughts and the acts of men whether deemed high or low noble or ignoble all things imagined or done for any save the eternal purpose are but dreams born of dreams and begetting hollowness to the clear of sight all feelings of self all love and hate joy and pain hope and regret are alike shadows youth and age beauty and horror sweetness and foulness are not different death and life are one and the same and space and time exist but as the stage and the order of the perpetual shadow play all that exists in time must perish to the awakened there is no time or space or change no night or day no heat or cold no moon or season no present past or future form and the names of form are alike nothingness knowledge only is real and unto whomsoever gains it the universe becomes a ghost but it is written he who hath overcome time in the past and the future must be of exceedingly pure understanding such understanding is not yours still to your eyes the shadow seems the substance and darkness light and voidness beauty and therefore to see your former births could give you only pain i asked had i found strength to look back to the beginning back to the verge of time could i have read the secret of the universe nay was answer made only by infinite vision can the secret be read could you have looked back incomparably further than your power permitted then the past would have become for you the future and could you have endured even yet more the future would have orbed back for you into the present yet why i murmured marvelling what is the circle circle there is none was the response circle there is none but the great phantom whirl of birth and death to which by their own thoughts and deeds the ignorant remain condemned but this has being only in time and time itself is illusion End of section 14. End of Gleanings in Buddha Fields by Lafcadio Hearn.